In wrestling, as in any form of entertainment, it's all about keeping yourself relevant. And one of the best ways to do this is to ensure that you're always changing with the times. That's why being able to evolve is so important for a performer, because if they can do this, then they'll have a much easier time staying on top. But what are the best examples of this? Well, that's exactly what we're going to be looking at today. So join us as we take a deep dive into chameleons, wrestlers who reinvented themselves. And of course, if you're going to start anywhere, we should really start with the man who many consider to be the master of reinvention, and that's Chris Jericho. Yes, while he may have started out his career as a pretty typical white meat babyface while working in Japan, Mexico, and even Extreme Championship Wrestling as the Lionheart, it wouldn't be until partway through his WCW run in the late 90s that the future undisputed champion really managed to find who he was. And that was because here he made his first great transformation when he morphed into a comedic heel who thought constantly the company were out to get him. That gimmick then saw him get so over with fans, he'd grow frustrated with his lack of a push in Atlanta and instead make the jump over to WWF where he became Y2J, the Millennium Man and self-proclaimed savior of wrestling. Of course, after this, it was truly off to the races for Jericho as he became one of the most over people in Vince McMahon's promotion. That said, he'd eventually grow tired of the character after a while, and it was this feeling which led to him taking some time away from the industry in 2005. Luckily though, he would return two years later and, when he did, he'd now be sporting another new look. That said, this also represented one of the rare misses for the Canadian as in many people's eyes, it felt a little too similar to Y2J. So realizing this, he'd mix things up again in 2008 when he cut his hair shorter still and started wearing a suit and tie inspired by AWA star Nick Bockwinkle. And at this point, he'd also portray a more quiet and calculating villain akin to Anton Chigurh, someone who spoke softly but with a purpose, and who allowed Jericho to finally become a true main event force in WWE. But that wasn't the end of his reinventions yet, because following this, he'd take some more time away, all before returning at the 2011 Royal Rumble with a light-up jacket, which later inspired a certain Prince Devitt over in New Japan. And a few years after that, he'd create his next great incarnation when he developed The List, basically a notepad containing the names of all his enemies, which he frequently added to whenever someone pissed him off. Eventually, though, it would be his tag team partner Kevin Owens who drew his ire, and so once they split up, Jericho made his biggest leap yet, when in 2017 he flew to Japan to debut The Painmaker, a Clockwork Orange-inspired villain who had a match with Kenny Omega so good it contributed towards the birth of All Elite Wrestling two years later. Of course, when that company was born, the Canadian would be right there with them to serve as their first ever world champion. And though he would now be known as Le Champion, this didn't mark the end of Jericho's reinventions, as over the last few years alone, he's gone by a number of different monikers, such as the Demo God, Sports Entertainer, and most recently, the Ocho, after winning the Ring of Honor world title. So with so many reinventions, you might be wondering how anyone could ever compete. Well, well, perhaps no one else has the volume to match him, someone who's been able to keep himself at the top of the card for even longer by always changing his gimmick up might have something to say about who the best is at being a chameleon. And that's The Undertaker. Yes, back in 1990 when the dead man debuted as the zombie mortician brought to the ring by Brother Love, few could have imagined how long in story to run he would have. That said, had it been anyone else other than Mark Calloway playing the role, it likely would have died after a few years because he was one of the few people smart enough to realize when a change was needed. And this would lead to him making alterations to the gimmick regularly over the years, with the first of these coming in 1996 when he morphed into the more satanic Lord of Darkness. That then would eventually see him build a Ministry of Darkness around himself as he enacted a hostile takeover attempt of WWF. But when his attempts ultimately proved fruitless and it became clear to the man behind the character that the horror movie villain was getting a little long in the tooth, he'd take some time away, only to return once more in 2000. And here, he'd be wildly different than before, as now playing something far closer to his real-life personality, he'd become the American Badass, a tough-talking and even tougher-hitting biker. Of course, it took fans a little while to get used to this, but once they did, they fell in love with it just as they had the dead man before. 
Not that they'd get to cheer him forever, though, because by 2001, Calloway would have cut his hair and turned heel as he morphed into Big Evil, the measuring stick of Raw, who let everyone around him know that if they wanted him to make them famous, all they had to do was set foot in his yard. But this wouldn't be his final form, as it turned out because after years of fan demand, in 2004, The Undertaker returned to the Deadman incarnation which had first made him a star. Except this time it was slightly different as, with a new MMA style of offense, the whole thing acted as a hybrid of his two sides. And it would also mark the point he'd truly become the conscience of the company as, from there, the streak would become a thing and his character would gradually move to being that of the unkillable last outlaw the man who everyone wanted to beat at WrestleMania so as to make themselves a legend forever. But while Brock Lesnar was eventually the man to do this, in 2011, it was almost a WCW stalwart making the jump to New York in order to challenge the dead man. Of course, the reason this would have been such a big deal at the time is because, in the years prior, Sting had become WCW's equivalent to The Undertaker when he morphed from the surfer to the crow. That's right, while in the late 80s and early 90s, Steve Borden had served as the perfect colorful face painted baby face for the era of Saved by the Bell and the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. By 1996, with WCW being overrun by the invading NWO, he'd retreat from the ring altogether and start sitting in the rafters. And while there, he'd dress only in black and white, acting as an elegy to the company he once loved. That said, he would eventually return to the ring to save WCW from Hollywood Hogan and the rest of his crew. But when he did, he'd continue to wear the white face paint as a reminder that something within him had now changed forever. So it was just as well that this incarnation of Sting, one inspired by Brandon Lee's character in The Crow, would end up being more successful than his prior one. In fact, despite later changing things up for a while again in TNA when he became a Heath Ledger Joker-inspired menace, it was The Crow which remained his most iconic look. And that's why, during his runs with both WWE and AEW, he's reverted back to this version, with the latter run even seeing him have some great matches once more despite his age. But he's not the only legend who's found a second lease of life over in Jacksonville because elsewhere on the roster, Billy Gunn has been able to turn himself into a hot commodity all over again. Of course, he wasn't always in such high demand. No, during his early days in mid-90s WWF, he'd struggle after being saddled with the fun but very mid-card gimmick of Old Frontier Lawman who teamed up with his kayfabe brother as part of the Smoking Guns. Luckily then, he'd eventually find himself when, in 1997, he partnered up with the Road Dog and became Badass Billy Gunn, one half of the rebellious heel group, the New Age Outlaws. And given their nature of causing chaos everywhere they went, it only made sense they'd eventually be inducted into the ranks of D-Generation X, where they became bona fide pop culture stars to kids of the era. After a while though, Gunn started seeing himself as more of a singles performer, and so this was why he would leave his old DX buddies behind, as he went on solo runs as both Mr. Ass, and then later, the one Billy Gunn. Sadly though, neither of these would really stick, and so, by 2001, he'd return to the tag team division to act as the implied lover of his teammate, Chuck Palumbo. And once this gimmick was over, Gunn moved over to TNA to partner up with Road Dogg once more, where it felt like his career was finally starting to wind down. Obviously then, when he joined AEW as a player coach in 2019, no one expected he'd soon become more relevant than ever after he paired up with the acclaimed and started going by the name of Daddy Ass, scissor enthusiast and all-around fan favorite to crowds everywhere. Of course, he'd probably learned a lot about reinvention from another of his AEW colleagues though, as when it comes to Matt Hardy, he's been successfully changing things up since the early 2000s. After all, following his iconic tag team run with his brother Jeff in the late 90s, he was able to have his coming out party as a single star when he joined the SmackDown roster in 2002 and became version 1. But that wouldn't be his most memorable reinvention of course, because after signing with TNA in the early 2010s, he'd try out a number of different gimmicks, including Big Money Matt, all before settling on his masterpiece, Broken Matt Hardy. Yes, this is no doubt the one he'll be remembered for as the sheer anime lunacy of it has proven to be so popular it even inspired the cinematic match style which became so necessary during lockdown.
And the reason it's so great is that here, he's basically playing a man who took too many shots to the head and now believes himself to be a supervillain. With this getting so over with fans that he'd later even take his broken universe over to both WWE and AEW as well. But what about a former tag team partner of his during his broken days in New York? Well, they can hold a claim to being a master of reinvention themselves too as it happens, because in the case of Bray Wyatt, he's successfully revived his career not once, not twice, but three times. How did he do this? Well, after Husky Harris failed to get over with the early 2010s WWE audience, Wyndham Rotunda would retreat back to Florida Championship Wrestling, where he started developing a new character for himself, one based on both Robert De Niro's portrayal of Max Cady in the Cape Fear remake and an old 90s WWF character, Waylon Mercy. And this character would end up being Bray Wyatt, a Bayou cult leader who led his family of Luke Harper, Eric Rowan, and later Braun Strowman over to the main roster in 2012 and there proved to have such a cult personality around himself that fans quickly got behind him. Unfortunately though, poor booking would eventually derail this character altogether, and so, when things looked to be at their darkest, Wyndham retreated from WWE TV for a while so as to develop his next great incarnation. Of course, at first it was jarring to see him playing the role of a Mr. Rogers-style kids TV show host who aired segments directly from his Firefly Funhouse. But once fans got used to this and realized how cool it was, they were all in as every week more and more hints were dropped about the reveal of a dark side of this new Bray Wyatt. And that dark side would eventually reveal itself to be The Fiend, a horror movie villain WWE hadn't seen the likes of since the early days of Kane. That said, for as great as The Fiend was, he would also end up being botched by bad booking and so, when he was released from his contract in 2021, the heir to the Rotunda dynasty would have to think of something new all over again. Luckily for him then, he'd get the opportunity to do just this on the WWE stage once more, when, after Triple H took over as head of creative, he'd bring Bray back. That said, this time, it wouldn't be the Bayou leader or the fiend he'd be playing. No, it would be a new character again, one who was regretful of his past actions and who was being haunted by a mysterious figure named Uncle Howdy. But as this storyline is still playing itself out at the time of this video's recording, we'll have to wait and see how successful it ends up being. That said, if it's anywhere near as successful a transition as Bradshaw had when he morphed into JBL in 2004, then Bray will be on the top of the card again in no time. Of course, the reason the JBL character worked so well was that it was basically the other half of John Layfield's real personality. Sure, he'd gotten to show the hard-drinking, ass-kicking side to himself during his days as one half of the APA, but it wasn't until he started wearing the 10-gallon hat and coming down to the ring in a limo that fans got to see the entrepreneur in him. That's right, not many people watching at the time knew, but with his expertise in finance, Layfield had become a legit self-made millionaire. So when he used this to become the J.R. Ewing-inspired JBL then, it found so much success that after only a few months, he'd be WWE Champion with his subsequent run proving to be the longest in SmackDown's history at the time. And he wasn't the only tag team star of the Attitude Era who managed to get a successful solo run by going heel. That said, in the case of Bubba Ray Dudley, his time would come over in TNA instead. Yes, it was after leaving WWE and journeying down to Nashville that the ECW original found his true place as a single star. Of course, he would have to first abandon his tag team partner in order to do this as, in 2010, he'd turn heel on Devon Dudley, from there going it out on his own as Bully Ray. Thank God he did though because as a solo act, Bully Ray became a two-time world champion and at times, de facto top face of the company. And when that run was over, he'd have built up such a renewed reputation for himself that he'd even be able to move over to Ring of Honor and have a singles run there too. Then, once he was finished with this, he'd go back to his tag team ways for a nice nostalgia run with Devon over in WWE in the mid-2010s. And just to think, had it not been for that original change to the bully heel so late in his career, none of this might have ever happened. But even he's not the best example of someone who made a late career change which completely revitalized them, as in 1996, just when it looked like the days of Hulkamania were truly over, Terry Bollea introduced the world to Hollywood Hogan and had a run which was so good, it actually rivaled his heyday of the 80s. And that's because here, he did the unthinkable and turned heel, 
providing one of the most shocking moments in wrestling history when he dropped the big leg on Randy Savage at that year's Bash at the Beach, then formed the NWO with Scott Hall and Kevin Nash. Of course, if you weren't around at the time, it's impossible to underestimate how gigantic this was, as prior to his actions that night, Hulk Hogan had been the biggest babyface in wrestling history. After all, he was the man who took the industry to new heights as the top star of WWF during the golden era. With the mid-90s fans starting to tire of his antics, however, and with more than a few boos coming his way, Hogan was eventually convinced the smart thing to do was to reinvent himself as a heel if he wanted to have any chance of seeing out the rest of the decade on top. So that's exactly what he did then, dropping the traditional red and yellow in favor of black and white garb and shifting from wrestling's most beloved hero of the 80s to its most despised villain of the 90s. Hell, so successful was he at doing this, he was even able to start the ball rolling on the industry going mainstream once more. And this would reinvigorate him so much from here on that he'd win the WCW title five more times, main event Starcade 1997 in the biggest match wrestling had seen since Hogan and Andre over a decade before, and generally become one of the pillars of the company right when they were at their hottest. Then, once that ran its course, he was even able to take Hollywood Hogan back over to WWE in 2002, the very place he'd almost managed to kill after leaving it behind in 1993. But it's just as well he didn't kill it because, as the years have gone on and Vince McMahon's promotion has gone through a number of different eras, many stars have been given the opportunity to rise to the top. And in the modern day, with the exception of Roman Reigns, there's arguably no one in the entire company who's a bigger star than our next master of reinvention, Becky Lynch. But why does she get a spot on this list? Well, if for no other reason than she was able to survive one of the worst debut gimmicks ever seen when, during her humble beginning in NXT in 2013, she'd basically play a parody of an Irish woman, one who came out to the ring decked in all green gear, doing a jig worthy of river dance. Luckily though, Becky was talented enough to overcome this and so, after getting herself over with fans as an underdog babyface, she'd eventually morph into a newer, more steampunk-inspired incarnation of her character. And it was this incarnation she took up to the main roster with her in 2015, as from there, initially being outshone by the likes of Sasha Banks and Charlotte Flair, she'd have to prove herself all over again. Of course, it took her a few years to figure out how to do this, but once she did, it worked better than anyone could have ever possibly hoped. And that's because in 2018, Lynch underwent a meteoric rise when she started acting as an anti-authority babyface in the vein of Stone Cold Steve Austin. That said, like Austin before her, this was initially supposed to get the Irish woman over as a heel. But when she proved too cool to boo, the man, as she would now cockily refer to herself, rose all the way to the top of the card when at WrestleMania 35, she'd take part in the first ever women's main event at this show, there beating Ronda Rousey and Charlotte Flair to become the undisputed women's champion and de facto face of the company. But even that wasn't the end of her story because after taking a year off to give birth to her first child in early 2020, she'd come back at SummerSlam the following year and quickly shock everyone by turning heel. Yes, despite being the most popular person on the roster, man or woman, at the turn of the decade, Becky decided to challenge herself further by seeing if she could get people to boo her once more as Big Time Bex. But who was Big Time Bex? Well, she was an egomaniacal villain who often dressed like a cross between David Bowie and Lady Gaga and who wasn't shy about letting the rest of the women's roster know she was better than them. That said, for as successful as she ended up being with this role, it was always a matter of time until she returned to the side of the good guys, something she ultimately did in 2022. And the reason everyone knew this was going to happen eventually is because, at a certain point, someone becomes such a star that it's hard to get fans to boo them. And if you need any evidence of this, you only have to take a look at the legendary run of our next subject today, Terry Funk. Of course, while he was beloved to the 90s audience as a hardcore legend, this was not actually the original incarnation of the Funkster. No, way back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s when he was working all across the territory circuit, he'd develop a reputation for being one of the best technical wrestlers in the world, someone so good he was even able to hold the NWA world's title at one point. By the time it got to the end of the millennium though, times were changing and Funk had lost a step or two with age. 
So realizing he needed to reinvent himself for the new generation, he'd morph into a hardcore brawler, with this seeing him make waves over in the Japanese deathmatch scene, and then back in America again with his work in Extreme Championship Wrestling. Hell, in ECW, he'd basically serve as a mentor to the entire roster, unselfishly giving back to each of them and making them look like stars in the process. And that would ultimately see him be rewarded when he got to become a two-time ECW champion, and then have another run over in WWF with Cactus Jack, where he became a one-time tag team champion. Even after all this, though, he'd still continue to go on wrestling for over a decade, proving that no matter what age you are, as long as you still have the ability to come up with something new so as to refresh yourself, there's no reason you ever need to stop. But then all our subjects today have proven that, and in many cases, are continuing to prove that. So let it always be remembered then that the key to being a star forever in wrestling isn't about how good you are in the ring, or even how good you are on the mic. It's about how many risks you're willing to take doing something different whenever necessary.